So Rudy, uh, we got started here a little later today because um, I think your doggies needed some ice cream. Well, they always look for their <laughs> treat. <laughs> we go to Dairy Queen and they give them their little doggy cups. Believe it or not, they look for it. What, wait, what, for wait a second, you call them puppy cups though, right? Puppy That's cups. what they call them, puppy cups? They're puppy cups. They're, they're cooler because it's, uh, if you say, let's go guys, we're going on a little, you know, we're going, they know where they're going. So. <laughs> they're off to the DQ. To, that's, yeah. that's great. Well, I'm excited about today's show because, you know, that with all of the rancor that's going on, all of the politics, all of the polarization and everything, what gets lost, I think, is that there truly is the opportunity to achieve the classic American dream in this world today. Well, it's true, because it's not about race, religion. It's all about your dream and your goals. It's how you look at your goals. It's how you work hard at your goals. Mm -hmm. It's what you put into it. It's what you're going to get out of it. It's that simple. So yeah. quit talking about the other stuff, and let's talk about the goals. That's what she's saying. Well, Rudy, let me tell everybody who it is we're talking about. Friend of yours, Dr. Chien Fan Gibson. She was born in Tokyo, Japan to Taiwanese parents. And in 1971, with less than $200 to their name, she and her family immigrated to Texas to pursue the American dream. Struggling at first with both finances and the language barrier, she and her two sisters soon excelled in all three graduated with honors. After graduation from college, she and set her sights on a new goal and that was dentistry. And by 2016, she had been named president of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the third woman and the first woman of Asian descent to do so. Dr. Gibson is proof that immigrants achieving the classic American success story is still possible. So Rudy, let's welcome your friend, Dr. Chien Fan Gibson. So Rudy, how do you and Dr. Chien know each other? Well, first of all, you have to look at Rudy. First, my smile. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you look at Dr. Smile. She says, Rudy, I could help you. And uh, this was at a uh, dentist conference. And I said, wow, sure, let's get it done. And that's why I have my smile today, because of Dr. Chen. Isn't that cool? Wonderful. But, Joe, that yeah. goes well beyond the smile. This is why I'm excited about this interview. It's how she became that person that excites me. And I think America should hear this. And, and especially today where we're at today, because uh, she allowed no boundaries to get to her going and dream. And boy, she just went for it. And what an amazing story. She yeah, had. no, I'm, I'm excited to hear it. I mean, why don't yeah. we, we'll just launch into it. Um, doctor, your, your family immigrated to the US from Japan. I, I think the year was 1971. What, what's your Correct. earliest memory of coming to America or being in America? You know, uh, I still remember the address because it was 2230 Parkside Avenue in Los Angeles, California. And it's interesting that it's still ingrained because you, we lived in a very small apartment complex. We actually had a swing set in our apartment complex because it was just, everything was all squeezed in. And, um, you know, I remember just playing with my sisters out there, you know. Um, Trying to live the American dream to you than where you came from in any way. I repeat the question. I said, did it seem different to you in any other way? I mean, did you, did you feel like you were in a different land, so to speak? Well, well, you we were excited, obviously, and you know, being so young, it's hard to recollect all the little details that went into it. You you mm -hmm. do recollect the the educational process of which you see it in the pictures that our parents have from the photo albums back then. We had the photo albums, and you go through the uh, graduations, you know, the, from kindergarten and first grade and second grade and, and such. So yeah. process, yeah. You, you recollect those memories based on those photographs that the, uh, our parents uh, captured. Right. And, and Joe, them. what's interesting, well, you asked that question, but her first three years in grade school is what was most challenging. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it, too, is because my parents didn't know the the English language. And and for us, we didn't have anybody to help us in that 
in, in that growth of the English language and, you know, having command of it. And, and so we, you know, were failing everything left and right. Um, I think back then they had unsatisfactory and satisfactory, and I think I had a lot of views on my report card. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was proud of that, but I don't think I really understood the capacity of that either. <laughs> was it was it just that? Was it just the language barrier that that caused you to have that difficulty? I do believe so. I think a lot of it is because we're trying to adapt into the American culture, mm -hmm. and obviously, um, being Asian in nationality, I was born in Tokyo, but we're not Japanese. We were Taiwanese, and and so on top of it, my parents just had a dream. They wanted to come to the United States for the American dream. And so they said, you know, I want to be able to give this to my children. And so in that, my mom being a, a registered nurse and my dad was still in uh, trying to get his electrical and mechanical engineering um, doctorate. And he was shy basically of three months from doing that before he says, you know, I just have to start earning money to keep my family, you know, surviving in this, you know, um, world of, you know, this the USA. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't have anybody, they didn't have the support system. They didn't know anyone. You know, they left an entire family. And it was basically most over 25 years later before they were able to fly back to Taiwan wow. to visit family because it was expensive, you know, and, yeah. and flight wasn't as readily available. The cash flow wasn't readily available. But I saw what they sacrificed. And so I think for me, and it gets emotional, I guess, because you don't want to disappoint. You don't want to disappoint your your family for giving up everything. And so, wow, I got a little teary eyed over that. Yeah. But, but you know, you, you, you know, what's awesome. You had a teacher that took interest in you. Um, Mrs. Holloman, what, what how did that come about for you? Um, Mrs. Holloman, um, she was a black teacher and we lived in Texas. And in the fourth grade, she took notice of me doing my history project. It was labeling the Texas, you know, state capitals and cities and, and making a beautiful project out of it. And she came up to me and she made an announcement to the class to say, take a look at Miss Chian Fan's work. And look at the pride she took into drawing the Texas state and all the agriculture and all mm. the things that represented Texas. And I want people to see the work that went into it. And that was the first compliment I ever got in any, any school where that I looked up at her and she kept encouraging me. And I think that gave me the light going, wow, somebody accepts me for what I'm capable of and actually commended me. And I think all kids, every <laughs> nationality, every child needs that encouragement. And that was the first time I actually received that. And from that point on, I, I told my husband too, I was like, I became the driver to, to want to excel and became a 4.0 4 student and S plus, and, as you would call it in the grading system. And I wanted to achieve that because one, it made me feel good. One, I was able to contribute. And, and so that, that really, Mr. Holloman really was the turning point for me and gave me the light bulb to want to excel and do well. Did you stay in touch with her? You know, um, I, I don't know where she, I mean, that was many moons ago. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't know if, if, as, you, as you began to succeed, because, you know, in 1986, that was a banner year for you too, because that's when you became a U.S. citizen. What, what did that mean to you? You know, when you become a naturalized citizen, it becomes a turning point because one, it allowed me to partake in the pageantries into getting scholarships for further higher education and it allowed me to partake in things that I probably wouldn't have ever had that opportunity to. And I can only be grateful to be able to say, yes, I will protect and upheld all of what United States epitomizes. And um, to me, it was achieving the American dream. And, and that would be a statement reflecting what my parents came before me wanting to achieve for us. And that would be higher education. And so even though we talk about Mrs. Holloman, even in college, 
I was told when I went to my counselor, because I said I wanted to become a dentist. <laughs> you know, I look back at experiences and experiences that I've gone through isn't without failure first. Right. But just having the opportunity, having been naturalized to say, I can do this. And then having the desire to say, you know what, why not? Why not take the chance? You know, knowing that, sure, if they can do it, I can do it too. And even though I, I grew up in Houston and also in Arizona and then also in Seattle, there were hardships. There were, there were still prejudices that still exist, mm -hmm. but I didn't let that hold me down. It right. was more, let me try because if I don't try, I won't know. And in that process, I think that um, like I, when I ran for the Miss Ju uh, America's Junior Miss, I won the Washington State title, not realizing what it really entailed, but it was the encouragement of another friend that said, look, it is based on your academia, your physical fitness, your interview, your talent, and I know you can do this. And at that point at the university, at before, excuse me, it was at Curtis High School, University Place, Washington, that I said, well, all right, I'll go for it. And when I won the local, I didn't realize the capacity of it when I went to the state level when there were almost 200 girls in it. <laughs> and then it was the encouragement of the director that would say, don't panic do what you did at the local level, articulate what your, you know, your answers are well, and do what you did at the local level, you should do well. And so it was just the, the little bit of encouragement that, that someone would tell me that you, you can do this, that allowed me to be able to perform at, at the best and at my peak, you know? And so I went from Washington State's Junior Miss and then another sponsor wanted me to do a beauty pageant, and it was the Miss USA system. And being 19, 20, I was like, oh, I'm really not familiar with that. And that encouragement was also there, but it was the, the interview process that also allowed me to speak my mind, my words, and how I felt. And I think that transparency of who I was captured the judges' hearts, and, and that's how I became you know, Miss Washington, USA. Yeah. You know, you, you really personify the importance of uh, support, of uh, so having a support system. Um, you know, first your parents, and then uh, your teacher, and then uh, the folks along uh, the way in your uh, pageant competitions and so forth. When you look back on the pageants, well, what did competing in those contests really mean to you? How, how have you carried that experience on in your life? You know, pageantry is the stepping stone to other successes. And for me, I learned about how to interact with people, how to interview well for future positions and jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is it, it helped you groom yourself so that you were the professional. And, and so I can say that pageantry, if people don't like pageantry, it helped groom myself in so many different ways to be able to express myself, to have a platform, to be able to know where I stood. And when those judges elected me in all those different elements because of my capability to articulate how I felt and to know certain positions and to talk about dreams, about excelling, about you can do it. That was what they were looking for at that time for role models. And to think that I would be a role model was, I think, in some degrees, in, in many degrees, an honor because I've had teachers articulate that you can do it. And so just those little inklings of what people say to me that had an influence, that's where I can be the same to others. And so whether they're, you're a child and they're looking up to you for advice, whether you're a colleague in the dental profession and I'm teaching, and I want them to learn what I learned. And so in very, I guess, diverse ways, being in pageantry has elevated me to the success levels that I've achieved and to the person I've become. 
Then she sets her sights on dentistry, Joe. Yeah. My dentistry. <laughs> Interesting, because when you're when I was at the University of Washington, I had some student loans, and one of them was through the the, I guess student loan association, and they had a job opening. And I remember going, well, let me take that job opportunity by going to a dental office, and it was the student. I guess cleaning person, and you know, watching them in terms of how they moved patients around and scheduled them and I would be the one to help out in that process. It's almost like being an assistant, but then also helping them in the sterilization aspect. And I remember going, wow, I, I can do that. I, I'm gonna be the doctor though. <laughs> <laughs> I, this wasn't on our list of questions, but as, as, uh, as the doctor was talking, I, I recalled um, seeing commercials for uh, there's um, a number of uh, uh, you know of, of cosmetic dentistry um, commercials airing these days and and uh, I remember one of them in particular and and these people talk about um, how something that many people take for granted a, a nice smile um, and it's and it has such a dramatic effect on their confidence and their self-esteem that when they get uh, a transformation through cosmetic dentistry or you know any number of the the treatments and things it transforms their whole life yes. you must see that frequently in your in your day-to-day -day, um work life are there any that you can share in terms of where you actually saw someone literally transformed after the work that you've done? Yes, many have cried and, you know, gave me hugs because I'm also involved through the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the Give Back a Smile campaign. And when you can transform a person who has been through challenges themselves, abused, and then they're picking up their lives and we can give that smile to them, so they can be out into the workforce. That's just, it, it makes me cry too. Um, I've had people who just couldn't believe that they could have a smile. They like their temporaries and I'm like, that's not the real thing. <laughs> and then they love their smile and they're just like, I just should have done this a long time ago. It really enhanced their smile, who they are going to become and where they're going. And to see that smile, and because I've had a mild transformation just from simple orthodontics, that's why I love to do the Invisalign process, be able to teach people how to do that, to be able to teach people about how make a smile maker can, I guess, help you exude the confidence and make you beam more. You're going to smile more. There are people who've had smile transformations that never smile because they've ground down or they, their teeth or they've broken down their teeth from, you know, whatever their circumstances are and now they're smiling all the time you know people who won't look into the camera and all of a sudden they're coming in and they're smiling and they're just showing off their beautiful smile because it exudes who they are and their inner beauty and that's the joy of being a dentist you know you're like oh i can make something really magnificent and um, a big transformation for them. doc you're very humble uh people don't realize you're voted a top cosmetic dentist in the country and uh that's pretty cool joe mm -hmm. <laughs> yes absolutely the privilege of my colleagues having um voted me and the members uh as the president of the american academy of cosmetic dentistry mm -hmm. about three years ago and i'm still actively involved and i enjoy teaching what i can do to you know make the public aware of what a small transformation can do for them well, hot topic here coming up. It's called immigration has become a hot button in recent years. As an immigrant turned U.S. citizen, wow. Give your advice, Doc. You know, um, my immigration process did not happen in a year or two or three or five years. My parents, when they came in, you think about it, it was 1971. It took them 10 years having 
been labeled an illegal alien or having a green card, that 10 years to become naturalized in 1981. But somehow, because we didn't obviously have the electronic systems and stuff built in, we had the paper trails, the kids, you know, being all, un, you know, underage were lost in the, in, in the process. And it took another five years before we became naturalized. And so if the streamlined process exists, you know, and I, I know that people come to America wanting the American dream, if they have it where it's streamlined and it's efficient and it's fair and um, a quick process, I think that many would jump on the bandwagon to do it in the right process. I do believe in the immigration process. I do believe in the naturalization process, you know, having an oath to protect the country uh, because it is the American dream we all want. We all want to work here. We all want to be able to achieve, I guess, our, our, our status is here and to be able to have either education, have uh, a work life and, and, and not, um, and to be able to contribute. Mm -hmm. And so immigration is, is a very touchy subject, but it's, it's allowed me so many different opportunities. And I think that if people do it in the, in the process that's set forth and we streamline a process, that's where I would think that many people will, will do so appropriately. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I always say, you know what, you have the persistence, you have to have humor in life, and you have to laugh at things. And sometimes when I make mistakes and I don't intend for things to go the, the bad direction, you're like, okay, I just got to laugh it off. <laughs> you got to laugh at things. Well, you know? I have the smile to prove it, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> well, Dr. Chian Fan Gibson, thank you so much. You, uh, you're an inspiration, not only to the immigrant story, and success, but uh, just in general, your your spirit, um, your perseverance, and your self-reliance. It's sort of the theme of our show, and um, you just underscored it today with your story. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. And, you know, Rudy's story has always been an inspiration to many, inspiration to me, and that's why I want to inspire others as well to be able to come to America, to achieve the successes and the dreams and believe in yourself, knowing that we all make mistakes and we just keep carrying ourselves and have, in spite of difficulties, to have a purpose, to have a drive and um, affect others in, in what we do. So thank you for having me. Thank you again, uh, Rudy. And you, know, Doc, you know, Jim, your great support system there, Jim and the little Jimbo. Yes, yes. I love my family, my two gyms. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Joe, I told you. I told you she was the one that could change your view on everything just by what she did, how she did it, and how she looked at her dreams. Now, her dream changed, of course, because what did they first say to her? Oh, you can go be a coach or a teacher. Okay. Yeah, um, visit like teacher. Because you're athletically. Says no, no, no. That was just a platform for me. I have bigger dreams, and you got it. You got to be inspired by what she said. Yeah. No, I was. I, I thought it was great, and I, you know, I I love storytelling, and I'm a sucker for uh, stories like that, which are classic. Like we said in the introduction, it's the classic American success story. And it's wonderful. I, I'll tell you the other thing I was touched by too, was by how she sees her profession as a way of, of really transforming people. And I've, I've seen that. I've seen people who, you know, it's amazing how much a smile can give you confidence or, or take away your confidence. And so she's used her artistry, her dentistry to transform people and give them a whole new outlook on life. It's wonderful. Great suggestion of an interview today. Yes, it was my honor. For yeah. sure. And I was humbled by having yeah. Dr. On, uh, on the call with all of us and everybody that listens. Yeah. Well, we hope you found inspiration in Dr. Gibson's story. And we're always interested in your story. Like always, write to us, write to Rudy. That's Rudy at riseabovewithrudy.com. 
And otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you here again next week. Thanks, Rudy. Good to see you. You bet. See you, Joe.